the Sasanian Empire, slash SSNN slash or slash SSN slash, also known as Sasanian, Sasanid, Sasanid or Neo-Persian Empire, common nine known to its inhabitants as Rancharnandara with Makran and in Middle Persian A was the last Iranian Empire before the rise of Islam, ruled by the Sasanian dynasty from 224 AD to 651 AD. The Sasanian Empire which succeeded the Parthian Empire, was recognized as one of the leading world powers alongside its arch-rival the Byzantine Empire, for a period of more than 400 years. The Sasanian Empire was founded by Ardashir I, after the fall of the Parthian Empire and the defeat of the last Arsacid king, Artabanus V. At its greatest extent, the Sasanid Empire encompassed all of today's Iran, Iraq, Eastern Arabia, Bahrain, Kuwait, Oman, Qatif, Qatar, UAE, the Levant, Syria, Lebanon, Israel, Jordan, the Caucasus, Armenia, Georgia, Azerbaijan, Dagestan, South Ossetia, Abkhazia, Egypt, large parts of Turkey, much of Central Asia, Afghanistan, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, Yemen, and Pakistan. According to a legend, the Vexiloid of the Sasanid Empire was the Diraf Sher Kaviani. The Sasanian Empire during late antiquity is considered to have been one of Iran's most important and influential historical periods, and constituted the last great Iranian Empire before the Muslim conquest and the adoption of Islam. In many ways, the Sasanid period witnessed the peak of ancient Iranian civilization. Persia influenced Roman culture considerably during the Sasanid period. The Sasanids' cultural influence extended far beyond the empire's territorial borders, reaching as far as Western Europe, Africa, China, and India. It played a prominent role in the formation of both European and Asian medieval art. Much of what later became known as Islamic culture in architecture, poetry, and other subject matter was transferred from the Sasanids throughout the Muslim world. Conflicting accounts shroud the details of the fall of the Parthian Empire and subsequent rise of the Sasanid Empire in mystery. The Sasanid Empire was established in Estakr by Ardashir I. Papak was originally the ruler of a region called Kir. However, by the year 200, he managed to overthrow Gakir, and appoint himself as the new ruler of the Baz Rangids. His mother, Radhak, was the daughter of the provincial governor of Pars. Papak and his eldest son Shapur managed to expand their power over all of Pars. The subsequent events are unclear, due to the elusive nature of the sources. It is certain, however, that following the death of Papak, Ardashir who at the time was the governor of Darabjurd, got involved in a power struggle of his own with his elder brother Shapur. Sources reveal that Shapur, leaving for a meeting with his brother, was killed when the roof of a building collapsed on him. By the year 208, over the protests of his other brothers who were put to death, Ardashir declared himself ruler of Pars. Once Ardashir was appointed Shahan Shah, he moved his capital further to the south of Pars and founded Ardashir Quora, formerly Gur, modern-day Firuzabad. The city, well supported by high mountains and easily defendable through narrow passes, became the center of Ardashir's efforts to gain more power. The city was surrounded by a high, circular wall, probably copied from that of Darabjurd, and on the north side included a large palace, remains of which still survive today. After establishing his rule over Pars, Ardashir I rapidly extended his territory, demanding fealty from the local princes of Fars, and gaining control over the neighboring provinces of Kerman, Isfahan, Sujana, and Messine. This expansion quickly came to the attention of Artabanus V the Parthian king, who initially ordered the governor of Husistan to wage war against Ardashir in 224, but the battles were victories for Ardashir. In a second attempt to destroy Ardashir, Artabanus V himself met Ardashir in battle at Hormozgan, where Artabanus V met his death. Following the death of the Parthian ruler, Ardashir I went on to invade the western provinces of the now defunct Parthian Empire. At that time the Arsacid dynasty was divided between supporters of Artabanus V and Vologasus VI, which probably allowed Ardashir to consolidate his authority in the south with little or no interference from the Parthians. Ardashir was aided by the geography of the province of Fars, 
which was separated from the rest of Iran. Crowned in 224 at Tesiphon as the sole ruler of Persia, Ardashir took the title Shahanshah, or King of Kings, the inscriptions mention Adharanahid as his Banbishn and Banbishn, Queen of Queens, but her relationship with Ardashir is not established, bringing the 400-year-old Parthian Empire to an end, and beginning four centuries of Sassanid rule. In the next few years, local rebellions would form around the empire. Nonetheless, Ardashir I further expanded his new empire to the east and northwest, conquering the provinces of Sistan, Gorgon, Khorasan, Margayana, in modern Turkmenistan, Balkh and Karizmia. He also added Bahrain and Mosul to Sassanid's possessions. Later Sassanid inscriptions also claim the submission of the kings of Kishan, Turin and Mikran to Ardashir, although based on numismatic evidence, it is more likely that these actually submitted to Ardashir's son, the future Shapur I. In the west, assaults against Hatra, Armenia and Adiabani met with less success. In 230, he raided deep into Roman territory, and a Roman counter-offensive two years later ended inconclusively, although the Roman emperor, Alexander Severus, celebrated a triumph in Rome. Radashir I's son Shapur I continued the expansion of the empire, conquering Bactria and the western portion of the Kishan Empire, while leading several campaigns against Rome. Invading Rome and Mesopotamia, Shapur I captured Kari and Nisibis, but in 243 the Roman general Time Sathias defeated the Persians at Resena and regained the lost territories. The Emperor Gordian Iii's, 238-244, Subsequent advance down the Euphrates was defeated at Meshuk, 244, leading to Gordian's murder by his own troops and enabling Shapur to conclude a highly advantageous peace treaty with the new emperor Philip the Arab, by which he secured the immediate payment of 500,000 denarii and further annual payments. Shapur soon resumed the war, defeated the Romans at Barbalissos, 253, and then probably took and plundered Antioch. Roman counterattacks under the Emperor Valerian ended in disaster when the Roman army was defeated and besieged at Edessa and Valerian was captured by Shapur, remaining his prisoner for the rest of his life. Shapur celebrated his victory by carving the impressive rock reliefs in Naksheri Rustam and Bishapur, as well as a monumental inscription in Persian and Greek in the vicinity of Persepolis. He exploited his success by advancing into Anatolia, 260 but withdrew in disarray after defeats at the hands of the Romans and their Pomerane ally Odonathus, suffering the capture of his harem and the loss of all the Roman territories he had occupied. Shapur had intensive development plans. He ordered the construction of the first dam bridge in Iran and founded many cities, some settled in part by emigrants from the Roman territories, including Christians who could exercise their faith freely under Sassanid rule. Two cities, Bishapur and Nishapur, are named after him. He particularly favored Manichetism, protected Mani, who dedicated one of his books, the Shivaragan, to him, and sent many Manichaean missionaries abroad. He also befriended a Babylonian rabbi called Samuel. This friendship was advantageous for the Jewish community and gave them a respite from the oppressive laws enacted against them. Later kings reversed Shapur's policy of religious tolerance. Under pressure from Zoroastrian magi and influenced by the high priest Kartir, Bahram I killed Mani and persecuted his followers. Bahram too was, like his father, amenable to the wishes of the Zoroastrian priesthood. During his reign, the Sassanid capital Tesiphon was sacked by the Romans under Emperor Karas, and most of Armenia, after half a century of Persian rule was ceded to Diocletian. Succeeding Bahram III, who ruled briefly in 293, Narsa embarked on another war with the Romans. After an early success against the Emperor Galerius near Colonicum on the Euphrates in 296, Narsa was decisively defeated. Galerius had been reinforced, probably in the spring of 298, by a new contingent collected from the empire's Danubian holdings. Narsa did not advance from Armenia and Mesopotamia, leaving Galerius to lead the offensive in 298 with an attack on northern Mesopotamia via Armenia. Narsa retreated to Armenia to fight Galerius' force, to Narsa's disadvantage, 
the rugged Armenian terrain was favorable to Roman infantry, but not to Sassanid cavalry. Local aid gave Galerius the advantage of surprise over the Persian forces, and, in two successive battles, Galerius secured victories over Narse. During the second encounter, Roman forces seized Narsea's camp, his treasury, his harem, and his wife along with it. Galerius advanced into Media and Adiabene, winning successive victories, most prominently near Erzurum, and securing Nisibis, Nasibin, Turkey, before October 1, 298. He moved down the Tigris, taking Tesaphon. Narsae had previously sent an ambassador to Galerius to plead for the return of his wives and children. Peace negotiations began in the spring of 299, with both Diocletian and Galerius presiding. The conditions of the peace were heavy, Persia would give up territory to Rome, making the Tigris the boundary between the two empires. Further terms specified that Armenia was returned to Roman domination, with the fort of Zyathi as its border, Caucasian Iberia would pay allegiance to Rome under a Roman appointee, Nisibis, now under Roman rule would become the sole conduit for trade between Persia and Rome, and Rome would exercise control over the five satrapies between the Tigris and Armenia, Ingilini, Safanin, Safin, Arzanin, Akdiznik, Kortuan, and Zabdasin, near modern Hakkari, Turkey. The Sassanids ceded five provinces west of the Tigris, and agreed not to interfere in the affairs of Armenia and Georgia. In the aftermath of this defeat, Narsae gave up the throne and died a year later, leaving the Sassanid throne to his son, Hormized II. Unrest spread throughout the land, and while Hormized II suppressed revolts in Sistan and Kishan, he was unable to control the nobles and was subsequently killed by Bedouins in a hunting trip in 309. First Golden Era, 309-379 Following Hormized II's death, Arabs from the north started to ravage and plunder the eastern cities of the empire, even attacking the province of Fars, the birthplace of the Sassanid kings. Meanwhile, Persian nobles killed Hormized II's eldest son, blinded the second, and imprisoned the third, who later escaped to Roman territory. The throne was reserved for Shapur II, the unborn child of one of Hormized II's wives who was crowned in utero, the crown was placed upon his mother's stomach. During his youth the empire was controlled by his mother and the nobles. Upon Shapur II's coming of age, he assumed power and quickly proved to be an active and effective ruler. Shapur II first led his small but disciplined army south against the Arabs, whom he defeated, securing the southern areas of the empire. He then started his first campaign against the Romans in the west, where Persian forces won a series of battles but were unable to make territorial gains due to the failure of repeated sieges of the key frontier city of Nisibis, and Roman success in retaking the cities of Singara and Amida, after they had fallen to the Persians. These campaigns were halted by nomadic raids along the eastern borders of the empire, which threatened Transoxiana, a strategically critical area for control of the Silk Road. Shapur therefore marched east toward Transoxiana to meet the eastern nomads, leaving his local commanders to mount nuisance raids on the Romans. 45 he crushed the Central Asian tribes, and annexed the area as a new province. He completed the conquest of the area now known as Afghanistan. Cultural expansion followed this victory, and Sassanid art penetrated Turkestan, reaching as far as China. Shapur, along with the nomad king Grumbates, started his second campaign against the Romans in 359 and soon succeeded in taking Singara and Amida again. In response, the Roman Emperor Julian struck deep into Persian territory and defeated Shapur's forces at Tesaphon. He failed to take the capital, however, and was killed while trying to retreat to Roman territory. His successor Jovian, trapped on the east bank of the Tigris, had to hand over all the provinces the Persians had ceded to Rome in 298, as well as Nisibis and Singara, to secure safe passage for his army out of Persia. Shapur II pursued a harsh religious policy. Under his reign, the collection of the Avesta, the sacred texts of Zoroastrianism, was completed, heresy and apostasy were punished, and Christians were persecuted. The latter was a reaction against the Christianization of the Roman Empire by Constantine the Great. 
Shapur II, like Shapur I, was amicable towards Jews, who lived in relative freedom and gained many advantages in his period, see also Rabbah. At the time of Shapur's death, the Persian Empire was stronger than ever, with its enemies to the east pacified and Armenia under Persian control. From Shapur II's death until Kavad I's first coronation, there was a largely peaceful period with the Romans, by this time the Eastern Roman or Byzantine Empire, interrupted only by two brief wars, the first in 421-422 and the second in 440. Throughout this era, Sassanid religious policy differed dramatically from king to king. Despite a series of weak leaders, the administrative system established during Shapur II's reign remained strong, and the empire continued to function effectively. After Shapur II died in 379, he left a powerful empire to his half-brother Ardashir II, 379-383, son of Varam of Kishan, and his son Shapur III, 383-388, neither of whom demonstrated his predecessor's talent. Ardashir II, who was raised as the half-brother of the emperor, failed to fill his brother's shoes, and Shapur III was too much of a melancholy character to achieve anything. Baram IV, 388-399, although not as inactive as his father, still failed to achieve anything important for the empire. During this time Armenia was divided by treaty between the Roman and Sassanid empires. The Sassanids re-established their rule over Greater Armenia, while the Byzantine Empire held a small portion of Western Armenia. Baram IV's son Yazdijerd I, 399-421, is often compared to Constantine I. Like him, he was powerful both physically and diplomatically. Much like his Roman counterpart, Yazdijerd I was opportunistic. Like Constantine the Great, Yazdijerd I practiced religious tolerance and provided freedom for the rise of religious minorities. He stopped the persecution against the Christians and even punished nobles and priests who persecuted them. His reign marked a relatively peaceful era. He made lasting peace with the Romans and even took the young Theodosius II, 408 450, under his guardianship. He also married a Jewish princess who bore him a son called Narsai. Yazdijerd I's successor was his son Baram V, 421 438, one of the most well known Sassanid kings and the hero of many myths. These myths persisted even after the destruction of the Sassanid Empire by the Arabs. Baram V, better known as Baram Igur, gained the crown after Yazdijerd I's sudden death, or assassination, against the opposition of the grandees with the help of Al Mundhur, the Arabic dynast of Al Hira. Baram V's mother was Sashandukt, the daughter of the Jewish exilarch. In 427, he crushed an invasion in the east by the nomadic Hephthalites, extending his influence into Central Asia, where his portrait survived for centuries on the coinage of Bokhara, in modern Uzbekistan. Baram V deposed the vassal king of the Persian part of Armenia and made it a province. Baram V is a great favorite in Persian tradition, which relates many stories of his valor and beauty, of his victories over the Romans, Turkic peoples, Indians, and Africans, and of his adventures in hunting and in love, he is called Baram Igur, Gur meaning Onegur, on account of his love for hunting and, in particular, hunting Onegurs. He symbolized a king at the height of a golden age. He had won his crown by competing with his brother and spent time fighting foreign enemies, but mostly kept himself amused by hunting and court parties with his famous band of ladies and courtiers. He embodied royal prosperity. During his time, the best pieces of Sassanid literature were written, notable pieces of Sassanid music were composed, and sports such as polo became royal pastimes, a tradition that continues to this day in many kingdoms. Baram V.S. son Yazdijerd II, 438-457, was a just, moderate ruler, but in contrast to Yazdijerd I, practiced a harsh policy towards minority religions, particularly Christianity. At the beginning of his reign, Yazdijerd II gathered a mixed army of various nations, including his Indian allies, and attacked the Eastern Roman Empire in 441, but peace was soon restored after small-scale fighting. He then gathered his forces in Nishapur in 443 and launched a prolonged campaign against the Kedarites. Finally, after a number of battles, 
he crushed the Kedarites and drove them out beyond the Oxus River in 450. During his eastern campaign, Yazdijerd II grew suspicious of the Christians in the army and expelled them all from the governing body and army. He then persecuted the Christians and, to a much lesser extent, the Jews. In order to re-establish Zoroastrianism in Armenia, he crushed an uprising of Armenian Christians at the Battle of Vartanans in 451. The Armenians, however, remained primarily Christian. In his later years, he was engaged yet again with Kedarites until his death in 457. Hormizd III, 457-459, younger son of Yazdijerd II, ascended to the throne. During his short rule, he continually fought with his elder brother Perizai, who had the support of nobility, and with the Hephthalites in Bactria. He was killed by his brother Perez in 459. In the beginning of the 5th century, the Hephthalites, White Huns, along with other nomadic groups, attacked Persia. At first Baram V and Yazdijerd II inflicted decisive defeats against them and drove them back eastward. The Huns returned at the end of 5th century and defeated Perez I, 457-484, in 483. Following this victory, the Huns invaded and plundered parts of eastern Persia for two years. They exacted heavy tribute for some years thereafter. These attacks brought instability and chaos to the kingdom. Perez I tried again to drive out the Hephthalites, but on the way to Herat, he and his army were trapped by the Huns in the desert, Perez I was killed, and his army was wiped out. After this victory, the Hephthalites advanced forward to the city of Herat, throwing the empire into chaos. Eventually, a noble Persian from the old family of Karen, Zarmir, or Sakra, restored some degree of order. He raised Balash, one of Perez I's brothers, to the throne, although the Hunnic threat persisted until the reign of Khosrau I Balash, 484-488 was a mild and generous monarch, who made concessions to the Christians, however, he took no action against the empire's enemies, particularly, the White Huns. Balash, after a reign of four years, was blinded and deposed, attributed to magnates, and his nephew Kavadai was raised to the throne. Kavadai, 488-531, was an energetic and reformist ruler. Kavadai gave his support to the sect founded by Mazduk, son of Bamdad, who demanded that the rich should divide their wives and their wealth with the poor. His intention evidently was, by adopting the doctrine of the Mazdakites, to break the influence of the magnates and the growing aristocracy. These reforms led to his being deposed and imprisoned in the castle of Oblivion in Susa, and his younger brother Jamisp, Zamaspes, was raised to the throne in 496. Kavadai, however, escaped in 498 and was given refuge by the White Hun King. Jamisp, 496-498, was installed on the Sassanid throne upon the deposition of Kavadai by members of the nobility. Jamisp was a good and kind king, and he reduced taxes in order to relieve the peasants and the poor. He was also an adherent of the mainstream Zoroastrian religion, diversions from which had cost Kavadai his throne and freedom. His reign soon ended when Kavadai, at the head of a large army granted to him by the Hephthalite king, returned to the empire's capital. Jamisp stepped down from his position and restored the throne to his brother. No further mention of Jamisp is made after the restoration of Kavadai, but it is widely believed that he was treated favorably at the court of his brother. Second Golden Era, 498-622 the Second Golden Era began after the second reign of Kavadai. With the support of the Heftalites, Kavadai launched a campaign against the Romans. In 502, he took Theodosiopolis in Armenia, but lost it soon afterwards. In 503 he took Amida on the Tigris. In 504, an invasion of Armenia by the Western Huns from the Caucasus led to an armistice the return of Amida to Roman control and a peace treaty in 506. In 521-522 Kavad lost control of Lazica, whose rulers switched their allegiance to the Romans, an attempt by the Iberians in 524-525 to do likewise triggered a war between Rome and Persia. In 527, 
a Roman offensive against Nisibis was repulsed and Roman efforts to fortify positions near the frontier were thwarted. In 530, Cavid sent an army under Perosus to attack the important Roman frontier city of Dara. The army was met by the Roman general Belisarius, and though superior in numbers, was defeated at the Battle of Dara. In the same year, a second Persian army under Mirmiro was defeated at Sadala by Roman forces under Sidas and Dorotheus, but in 531 a Persian army accompanied by a Lachamid contingent under Almundher III defeated Belisarius at the Battle of Colonicum, and in 532 an eternal peace was concluded. Although he could not free himself from the yoke of the Ephthalites, Cavid succeeded in restoring order in the interior and fought with general success against the Eastern Romans, founded several cities, some of which were named after him, and began to regulate the taxation and internal administration. After Cavid I, his son Khosrau I, also known as Anishirvan, with the immortal soul, ruled 531-579, ascended to the throne. He is the most celebrated of the Sassanid rulers. Khosrau I is most famous for his reforms in the aging governing body of Sassanids. He introduced a rational system of taxation based upon a survey of landed possessions, which his father had begun, and he tried in every way to increase the welfare and the revenues of his empire. Previous great feudal lords fielded their own military equipment, followers, and retainers. Khosrau I developed a new force of Deans, or knights, paid and equipped by the central government and the bureaucracy, tying the army and bureaucracy more closely to the central government than to local lords. Emperor Justinian I, 527-565, paid Khosrau I 440,000 pieces of gold as a part of the Eternal Peace Treaty of 532. In 540, Khosrau broke the treaty and invaded Syria, sacking Antioch and extorting large sums of money from a number of other cities. Further successes followed, in 541 Lazica defected to the Persian side, and in 542 a major Byzantine offensive in Armenia was defeated at Anglin. A five-year truce agreed to in 545 was interrupted in 547 when Lazica again switched sides and eventually expelled its Persian garrison with Byzantine help, the war resumed but remained confined to Lazica, which was retained by the Byzantines when peace was concluded in 562. In 565, Justinian I died and was succeeded by Justin II, 565-578, who resolved to stop subsidies to Arab chieftains to restrain them from raiding Byzantine territory in Syria. A year earlier, the Sassanid governor of Armenia, Chir Vishnasp of the Surin family, built a fire temple at Dvin near modern Yerevan, and he put to death an influential member of the Mamikanian family touching off a revolt which led to the massacre of the Persian governor and his guard in 571, while rebellion also broke out in Iberia. Justin II took advantage of the Armenian revolt to stop his yearly payments to Khosrau I for the defense of the Caucasus passes. The Armenians were welcomed as allies, and an army was sent into Sassanid territory which besieged Nisibis in 573. However, dissension among the Byzantine generals not only led to an abandonment of the siege, but they in turn were besieged in the city of Dara, which was taken by the Persians who then ravaged Syria, causing Justin II to agree to make annual payments in exchange for a five-year truce on the Mesopotamian front, although the war continued elsewhere. In 576 Khosrau I led his last campaign, an offensive into Anatolia which sacked Sebastia and Melitene, but ended in disaster defeated outside Melitene, the Persians suffered heavy losses as they fled across the Euphrates under Byzantine attack. Taking advantage of Persian disarray, the Byzantines raided deep into Khosrau's territory, even mounting amphibious attacks across the Caspian Sea. Khosrau sued for peace, but he decided to continue the war after a victory by his general Tam Khosrau in Armenia in 577, and fighting resumed in Mesopotamia. The Armenian revolt came to an end with a general amnesty, which brought Armenia back into the Sassanid Empire. Around 570, Mahdi Karab, half-brother of the King of Yemen, requested Khosrau I's intervention. Khosrau I sent a fleet and a small army under a commander called Variz to the area near present Aden, and they marched against the capital San Al, 
which was occupied. Saif, son of Mardkarab, who had accompanied the expedition, became king sometime between 575 and 577. Thus, the Sassanids were able to establish a base in South Arabia to control the sea trade with the east. Later, the South Arabian kingdom renounced Sassanid overlordship, and another Persian expedition was sent in 598 that successfully annexed southern Arabia as a Sassanid province, which lasted until the time of troubles after Khosrau II. Khosrau I's reign witnessed the rise of the Dickens, literally, village lords, the petty land-holding nobility who were the backbone of later Sassanid provincial administration and the tax collection system. Khosrau I was a great builder, embellishing his capital, founding new towns, and constructing new buildings. He rebuilt the canals and restocked the farms destroyed in the wars. He built strong fortifications at the passes and placed subject tribes in carefully chosen towns on the frontiers to act as guardians against invaders. He was tolerant of all religions, though he decreed that Zoroastrianism should be the official state religion, and was not unduly disturbed when one of his sons became a Christian. After Khosrau I, Hormized IV, 579-590, took the throne. The war with the Byzantines continued to rage intensely but inconclusively until the general Baram Koban, dismissed and humiliated by Hormizd, rose in revolt in 589. The following year, Hormizd was overthrown by a palace coup and his son Khosrau II, 596-28, placed on the throne. However, this change of ruler failed to placate Baram, who defeated Khosrau, forcing him to flee to Byzantine territory, and seized the throne for himself as Baram VI. Khosrau begged Byzantine Emperor Maurice, 582-602, for assistance against Baram, offering to cede the Western Caucasus to the Byzantines. To cement the alliance, Khosrau also married Maurice's daughter Miriam. Under the command of Khosrau and the Byzantine generals Narzas and John Mistakhan, the new combined Byzantine-Persian army raised a rebellion against Baram, defeating him at the Battle of Blarathon in 591. When Khosrau was subsequently restored to power he kept his promise, handing over control of western Armenia and Caucasian Iberia. The new peace arrangement allowed the two empires to focus on military matters elsewhere, Khosrau expanded the Sassanid Empire's eastern frontier while Maurice restored Byzantine control of the Balkans. After Maurice was overthrown and killed by Phocas, 602-610, in 602, however, Khosrau II used the murder of his benefactor as a pretext to begin a new invasion, which benefited from continuing civil war in the Byzantine Empire and met little effective resistance. Khosrau's generals systematically subdued the heavily fortified frontier cities of Byzantine Mesopotamia and Armenia, laying the foundations for unprecedented expansion. The Persians overran Syria and captured Antioch in 611. In 613, outside Antioch, the Persian generals Sharbaraz and Shehin decisively defeated a major counter-attack led in person by the Byzantine emperor Heraclius. Thereafter, the Persian advance continued unchecked. Jerusalem fell in 614, Alexandria in 619, and the rest of Egypt by 621. The Sassanid dream of restoring the Achaemenid boundaries was almost complete, while the Byzantine Empire was on the verge of collapse. This remarkable peak of expansion was paralleled by a blossoming of Persian art, music, and architecture. Decline and Fall, 622-651 While originally seeming successful at a first glance, the campaign of Khosrau II had actually exhausted the Persian army and Persian treasuries. In an effort to rebuild the national treasuries, Khosrau overtaxed the population. Thus, seeing the opportunity, Heraclius, 610-641, drew on all his diminished and devastated empire's remaining resources, reorganized his armies, and mounted a remarkable counter-offensive. Between 622 and 627 he campaigned against the Persians in Anatolia and the Caucasus winning a string of victories against Persian forces under Khosrau, Sharbar Raz, Shehin, and Shara Plakan, sacking the great Zoroastrian temple at Gonzuk, and securing assistance from the Hazars and western Turkic Khaganate. In 626, 
Constantinople was besieged by Slavic and Avar forces which were supported by a Persian army under Sharbaraz on the far side of the Bosphorus, but attempts to ferry the Persians across were blocked by the Byzantine fleet and the siege ended in failure. In 627-628, Heraclius mounted a winter invasion of Mesopotamia and, despite the departure of his Hazar allies, defeated a Persian army commanded by Razad in the Battle of Nineveh. He then marched down the Tigris, devastating the country and sacking Khosrau's palace at Dastagerd. He was prevented from attacking Tesiphon by the destruction of the bridges on the Narawan Canal and conducted further raids before withdrawing up the Dila into northwestern Iran. The impact of Heraclius's victories, the devastation of the richest territories of the Sassanid Empire, and the humiliating destruction of high-profile targets such as Gonzak and Dastagerd fatally undermined Khosrau's prestige and his support among the Persian aristocracy. In early 628, he was overthrown and murdered by his son Kavad II, 628, who immediately brought an end to the war, agreeing to withdraw from all occupied territories. In 629, Heraclius restored the True Cross to Jerusalem in a majestic ceremony. Kavad died within months, and chaos and civil war followed. Over a period of four years and five successive kings, including two daughters of Khosrau II and Spabet Sharbaraz, the Sassanid Empire weakened considerably. The power of the central authority passed into the hands of the generals. It would take several years for a strong king to emerge from a series of coups, and the Sassanids never had time to recover fully. In the spring of 632, a grandson of Khosrau I who had lived in hiding in Estakr, Yazdijerd III, ascended the throne. The same year, the first raiders from the Arab tribes, newly united by Islam, arrived in Persian territory. According to Howard Johnston, years of warfare had exhausted both the Byzantines and the Persians. The Sassanids were further weakened by economic decline, heavy taxation, religious unrest, rigid social stratification, the increasing power of the provincial landholders, and a rapid turnover of rulers, facilitating the Islamic conquest of Persia. The Sassanids never mounted a truly effective resistance to the pressure applied by the initial Arab armies. Yazdijerd was a boy at the mercy of his advisers and incapable of uniting a vast country crumbling into small feudal kingdoms, despite the fact that the Byzantines, under similar pressure from the newly expansive Arabs, no longer threatened. Caliph Abu Bakr's commander Khalid Ibn Walid moved to capture Iraq in a series of lightning battles. Redeployed to the Syrian front against the Byzantines in June 634, Khalid's successor in Iraq failed him, and Muslims were defeated in the Battle of the Bridge in 634, which resulted in a Sassanid victory. However, the Arab threat did not stop there and reappeared shortly from the disciplined armies of Khalid Ibn Walid once one of Muhammad's chosen companions in arms and leader of the Arab army. In 637, a Muslim army under the Caliph Umar ibn al khat defeated a larger Persian force led by General Rustam Farakzad at the plains of al qdasiyah and advanced on Tesaphon, which fell after a prolonged siege. Yazdijerd fled eastward from Tesaphon, leaving behind him most of the empire's vast treasury. The Arabs captured Tesaphon shortly afterward acquiring a powerful financial resource and leaving the Sassanid government strapped for funds. A number of Sassanid governors attempted to combine their forces to throw back the invaders, but the effort was crippled by the lack of a strong central authority, and the governors were defeated at the Battle of Nihond. The empire, with its military command structure non-existent, its non-noble troop levies decimated, its financial resources effectively destroyed, and the Asawaran, Azadan, nightly cast destroyed piecemeal, was now utterly helpless in the face of the invaders. Upon hearing of the defeat in Nihond, Yazdijerd along with Farukhzad and with some of the Persian nobles fled further inland to the eastern province of Khorasan. Yazdijerd was assassinated by a miller in Merv in late 651, while some of the nobles settled in Central Asia, where they contributed greatly to spreading Persian culture and language in those regions and to the establishment of the first native Iranian Islamic dynasty, the Samanid dynasty, which sought to revive Sassanid traditions. The abrupt fall of the Sassanid Empire was completed in a period of five years, 
and most of its territory was absorbed into the Islamic Caliphate, however, many Iranian cities resisted and fought against the invaders several times. Islamic Caliphates repeatedly suppressed revolts in cities such as Ray, Isfahan, and Hamadan. The local population was initially under little pressure to convert to Islam, remaining as Dhimmi subjects of the Muslim state and paying a jizya. Jizya practically replaced poll taxes imposed by the Sassanids. In addition, the old Sassanid land tax, known in Arabic as Karaj, was also adopted. Caliph Umar is said to have occasionally set up a commission to survey the taxes, to judge if they were more than the land could bear. Conversion of the Persian population to Islam would take place gradually, particularly as Persian-speaking elites attempted to gain positions of prestige under the Abbasid Caliphate. The Sassanids established an empire roughly within the frontiers achieved by the Parthian Arsacids, with the capital at Tesiphon in the Azaristan province. In administering this empire, Sassanid rulers took the title of Shahanshah, King of Kings, became the central overlords and also assumed guardianship of the sacred fire, the symbol of the national religion. This symbol is explicit on Sassanid coins where the reigning monarch, with his crown and regalia of office, appears on the obverse, backed by the sacred fire, the symbol of the national religion, on the coin's reverse. Sassanid queens had the title of Banbishn and Banbishn, Queen of Queens. On a smaller scale, the territory might also be ruled by a number of petty rulers from a noble family, known as Shardar, overseen directly by Shahan Shah. The districts of the provinces were ruled by a Sharab and a Maut, chief priest. The Maut's job was to deal with estate rights and other legal things. Sassanian rule was characterized by considerable centralization, ambitious urban planning, agricultural development, and technological improvements 60 below the king, a powerful bureaucracy carried out much of the affairs of government, the head of the bureaucracy was the Wuzurg Framadar, vizier or prime minister. Within this bureaucracy the Zoroastrian priesthood was immensely powerful. The head of the Magi priestly class, the Maubedon Mount, along with the commander-in-chief, the Spabed, the head of traders and merchants syndicate Hotokshin Bod and Minister of Agriculture, Waster Yoshin Sala, who was also head of farmers, were, below the emperor, the most powerful men of the Sassanid state. The Sassanian rulers always considered the advice of their ministers. A Muslim historian, Masudi, praised the Sassanian administration by saying, Excellent administration of the Sassanian kings, their well-ordered policy, their care for their subjects, and the prosperity of their domains. In normal times, the monarchical office was hereditary, but might be transferred by the king to a younger son, in two instances the supreme power was held by queens. When no direct heir was available, the nobles and prelates chose a ruler, but their choice was restricted to members of the royal family. The Sassanian nobility was a mixture of old Parthian clans, Persian aristocratic families, and noble families from subjected territories. Many new noble families had risen after the dissolution of the Parthian dynasty, while several of the once dominant seven Parthian clans remained of high importance. At the court of Ardashur I, the old Arsacid families of the House of Karan and the House of Surin, along with several other families, the Varazi and Andigans, held positions of great honor. Alongside these Iranian and non-Iranian noble families, the kings of Merv, Abarshar, Karmania, Sakistan, Iberia, and Adiabani, who are mentioned as holding positions of honor amongst the nobles, appeared at the court of the Shahan Shah. Indeed, the extensive domains of the Surans, Karans, and Varazi, had become part of the original Sassanid state as semi-independent states. Thus, the noble families that attended at the court of the Sassanid Empire continued to be ruling lines in their own right although subordinate to the Shahan Shah. In general, Wuzurgan from Iranian families held the most powerful positions in the imperial administration, including governorships of border provinces, Martban. Most of these positions were patrimonial, and many were passed down through a single family for generations. The Marsbans of greatest seniority were permitted a silver throne, while Marsbans of the most strategic border provinces, such as the Caucasus province, were allowed a golden throne. In military campaigns, 
the regional Mars bands could be regarded as field marshals, while lesser spabeds could command a field army. Culturally, the Sassanids implemented a system of social stratification. This system was supported by Zoroastrianism, which was established as the state religion. Other religions appear to have been largely tolerated, although this claim has been debated. Sassanid emperors consciously sought to resuscitate Persian traditions and to obliterate Greek cultural influence. The active army of the Sassanid Empire originated from Ardashir I, the first Shahan Shah of the empire. Ardashir restored the Achaemenid military organizations, retained the Parthian cavalry model, and employed new types of armor and siege warfare techniques. Role of Priests The relationship between priests and warriors was important, because the concept of Ranshar had been revived by the priests. Without this relationship, the Sassanid Empire would not have survived in its beginning stages. Because of this relationship between the warriors and the priests, religion and state were considered inseparable in the Zoroastrian religion. However, it is this same relationship that caused the weakening of the empire, when each group tried to impose their power onto the other. Disagreements between the priests and the warriors led to fragmentation within the empire, which led to its downfall. Infantry The pagan formed the bulk of the Sassanid infantry, and were often recruited from the peasant population. Each unit was headed by an officer called a pagan sala, which meant commander of the infantry and their main task was to guard the baggage train, serve as pages to the Asverin, a higher rank, storm fortification walls, undertake entrenchment projects, and excavate mines. Those serving in the infantry were fitted with shields and lances. To make the size of their army larger, the Sassanids added soldiers provided by the Medes and the Dale Amites to their own. The Medes provided the Sassanid army with high-quality javelin throwers, slingers, and heavy infantry. Iranian infantry are described by Ammianus Marcel Linus as armed like gladiators and obey orders like so many horse boys. The Dale Amid people also served as infantry and were Iranian people who lived mainly within Jalan, Iranian Azerbaijan and Mazandaran. They are reported as having fought with weapons such as daggers, swords and javelins and reputed to have been recognized by Romans for their skills and hardiness in close quarter combat. One account of Dale Amites recounted their participation in an invasion of Yemen where 800 of them were led by the Dale Amit officer Varis. Varis would eventually defeat the Arab forces in Yemen and its capital Sana'a making it a Sassanian vassal until the invasion of Persia by Arabs. Navy The Sassanid navy was an important constituent of the Sassanid military from the time that Ardashir I conquered the Arab side of the Persian Gulf. Because controlling the Persian Gulf was an economic necessity, the Sassanid navy worked to keep it safe from piracy, prevent Roman encroachment, and keep the Arab tribes from getting hostile. However, it is believed by many historians that the naval force could not have been a strong one, as the men serving in the navy were those who were confined in prisons. The leader of the navy bore the title of Envbed. The cavalry used during the Sassanid Empire were two types of heavy cavalry units, Clibinarii and Cataphracts. The first cavalry force, composed of elite noblemen trained since youth for military service, was supported by light cavalry, infantry and archers 82 mercenaries and tribal people of the empire, including the Turks, Kishans, Hazars, Georgians and Armenians were included in these first cavalry units. The second cavalry involved the use of the war elephants. In fact, it was their specialty to deploy elephants as cavalry support. Unlike the Parthians, the Sassanids developed advanced siege engines. The development of siege weapons was a useful weapon during conflicts with Rome, in which success hinged upon the ability to seize cities and other fortified points. Conversely, the Sassanids also developed a number of techniques for defending their own cities from attack. The Sassanid army was much like the preceding Parthian army, although some of the Sassanids' heavy cavalry were equipped with lances, while Parthian armies were heavily equipped with bows. The Roman historian Ammianus Marcellinus's description of Shapur II's Clibinarii cavalry manifestly shows how heavily equipped it was, and how only a portion were spear-equipped. All the companies were clad in iron, and all parts of their bodies were covered with thick plates, so fitted that the stiff joints conformed with those of their limbs, 
and the forms of human faces were so skillfully fitted to their heads, that since their entire body was covered with metal, arrows that fell upon them could lodge only where they could see a little through tiny openings opposite the pupil of the eye, or where through the tip of their nose they were able to get a little breath. Of these, some who were armed with pikes, stood so motionless that you would have thought them held fast by clamps of bronze. Horsemen in the Sassanid cavalry lacked a stirrup. Instead, they used a war saddle which had a cantle at the back and two guard clamps which curved across the top of the rider's thighs. This allowed the horsemen to stay in the saddle at all times during the battle, especially during violent encounters. The Byzantine Emperor Morikshos also emphasizes in his Strategikon that many of the Sassanid heavy cavalry did not carry spears, relying on their bows as their primary weapons. However the Takai Bustan reliefs and Al Taberi's famed list of equipment required for Dickon knights which included the lance, provide a contrast. What is certain is that the horseman's paraphernalia was extensive. The amount of money involved in maintaining a warrior of the Asawaran, Azadan, knightly caste required a small estate, and the Asawaran, Azadan, knightly caste received that from the throne, and in return, were the throne's most notable defenders in time of war. The Sassanids, like the Parthians, were in constant hostilities with the Roman Empire. Following the division of the Roman Empire in 395, the Eastern Roman Empire, with its capital at Constantinople, replaced the Roman Empire as Persia's principal western enemy. Hostilities between the two empires became more frequent 60 The Sassanids, similar to the Roman Empire, were in a constant state of conflict with neighboring kingdoms and nomadic hordes. Although the threat of nomadic incursions could never be fully resolved, the Sassanids generally dealt much more successfully with these matters than did the Romans, due to their policy of making coordinated campaigns against threatening nomads. In the west, Sassanid territory abutted that of the large and stable Roman state, but to the east, its nearest neighbors were the Kishan Empire and nomadic tribes such as the White Huns. The construction of fortifications such as Tus Citadel or the city of Nishapur, which later became a center of learning and trade, also assisted in defending the eastern provinces from attack. In South and Central Arabia, Bedouin Arab tribes occasionally raided the Sassanid Empire. The Kingdom of Alhira, a Sassanid vassal kingdom, was established to form a buffer zone between the empire's heartland and the Bedouin tribes. The dissolution of the Kingdom of Alhira by Khosrau II in 602, contributed greatly to decisive Sassanid defeats suffered against Bedouin Arabs later in the century. These defeats resulted in a sudden takeover of the Sassanid Empire by Bedouin tribes under the Islamic banner. In the north, Hazars and other Turkic nomads frequently assaulted the northern provinces of the empire. They plundered Media in 634. Shortly thereafter, the Persian army defeated them and drove them out. The Sassanids built numerous fortifications in the Caucasus region to halt these attacks. In 522, before Khosrau's reign, a group of Monophysite Oxumites led an attack on the dominant Hymerites of southern Arabia. The local Arab leader was able to resist the attack but appealed to the Sassanians for aid, while the Oxumites subsequently turned towards the Byzantines for help. The Oxumites sent another force across the Red Sea and this time successfully killed the Arab leader and replaced him with an Aksumite man to be king of the region. In 531, Justinian suggested that the Oxumites of Yemen should cut out the Persians from Indian trade by maritime trade with the Indians. The Ethiopians never met this request because an Aksumite general named Abraha took control of the Yemenite throne and created an independent nation. After Abraha's death one of his sons, Mahdi Karab, went into exile while his half-brother took the throne. After being denied by Justinian, Mahdi Karab sought help from Khosrau, who sent a small fleet and army under Commander Varis to depose the new king of Yemen. After capturing the capital city San Al, Mahdi Karab's son, Saif, was put on the throne. Justinian was ultimately responsible for Sassanian maritime presence in Yemen. By not providing the Yemenite Arabs support, Khosrau was able to help Mahdi Karab and subsequently established Yemen as a principality of the Sassanian Empire. Like their predecessors the Parthians, the Sassanid Empire carried out active foreign relations with China, 
and ambassadors from Persia frequently traveled to China. Chinese documents report on 13 Sassanid embassies to China. Commercially, land and sea trade with China was important to both the Sassanid and Chinese empires. Large numbers of Sassanid coins have been found in southern China, confirming maritime trade. On different occasions, Sassanid kings sent their most talented Persian musicians and dancers to the Chinese imperial court at Luoyang during the Jin and Northern Wei dynasties, and to Chang'an during the Sui and Tang dynasties. Both empires benefited from trade along the Silk Road and shared a common interest in preserving and protecting that trade. They cooperated in guarding the trade routes through Central Asia, and both built outposts in border areas to keep caravans safe from nomadic tribes and bandits. Politically, there is evidence of several Sassanid and Chinese efforts in forging alliances against the common enemy, the Hephthalites. Upon the rise of the nomadic Gok Turks in Inner Asia, there is also what looks like a collaboration between China and Sassanid to defuse Turkic advances. Documents from M.T. Mok talk about the presence of a Chinese general in the service of the King of Sogdiana at the time of the Arab invasions. Following the invasion of Iran by Muslim Arabs, Peres III, son of Yazdijerd III, escaped along with a few Persian nobles and took refuge in the Chinese imperial court. Both Peres and his son Narsi, Chinese Nishi, were given high titles at the Chinese court. On at least two occasions, the last possibly in 670, Chinese troops were sent with Peres in order to restore him to the Sassanid throne with mixed results, one possibly ending in a short rule of Peres in Sistan, Saikstan, from which we have a few remaining numismatic evidences. Narsi later attained the position of a commander of the Chinese Imperial Guards, and his descendants lived in China as respected princes. The sister of the Sassanian prince Peres III was married into the imperial court, which allowed Sassanian refugees fleeing from the Arab conquest to settle in China. The emperor of China at this time was Emperor Jeozong of Tang. Following the conquest of Iran and neighboring regions, Shapur I extended his authority eastwards into the northwestern Indian subcontinent, Pakistan and Afghanistan. The previously autonomous Kishans were obliged to accept his suzerainty. These were the Western Kishans with control of Afghanistan while the Eastern Kishans were still active in India. Although the Kishan Empire declined at the end of the 3rd century, to be replaced by the Indian Gupta Empire in the 4th century, it is clear that the Sassanids remained relevant in India's northwest throughout this period. The Sassanid rulers exchanged ambassadors with the South Indian Kalyakya dynasty during the reign of Pulaksi II. Persia and northwestern India engaged in cultural as well as political intercourse during this period, as certain Sassanid practices spread into the Kishan territories. In particular, the Kishans were influenced by the Sassanid conception of kingship, which spread through the trade of Sassanid silverware and textiles depicting emperors hunting or dispensing justice. This cultural interchange did not, however, spread Sassanid religious practices or attitudes to the Kishans. While the Sassanids always adhered to a stated policy of religious proselytization, and sporadically engaged in persecution or forced conversion of minority religions, the Kishans preferred to adopt a policy of religious tolerance. Lower-level cultural interchanges also took place between India and Persia during this period. For example, Persians imported chess from India and changed the game's name from Chaturanga to Chatrang. In exchange, Persians introduced backgammon to India. During Khosrau I's reign, many books were brought from India and translated into Pallavi, the language of the Sassanid Empire. Some of these later found their way into the literature of the Islamic world. A notable example of this was the translation of the Indian Panchatantra by one of Khosrau's ministers, Borzwia. This translation, known as the Kelali Va Demna, later made its way into Arabia and Europe 89 The details of Burzo's legendary journey to India and his daring acquisition of the Panchatantra are written in full details in Ferdowsi's Shahnameh, which says. In Indian books, Borzwia read that on a mountain in that land there grows a plant which when sprinkled over the dead revives them. Borzwia asked Khosrau I for permission to travel to India to obtain the plant. After a fruitless search, he was led to an ascetic who revealed the secret of the plant to him, the plant was word, the mountain learning, and the dead the ignorant. 
He told Borzwia of a book, The Remedy of Ignorance, called the Kalala, which was kept in a treasure chamber. The king of India gave Borzwia permission to read the Kalala, provided that he did not make a copy of it. Borzwia accepted the condition but each day memorized a chapter of the book. When he returned to his room he would record what he had memorized that day, thus creating a copy of the book, which he sent to Iran. In Iran, Bozergmer translated the book into Pahlavi and, at Borzwia's request, named the first chapter after him. Society Urbanism and Nomadism In contrast to Parthian society, the Sassanids renewed emphasis on charismatic and centralized government. In Sassanid theory, the ideal society could maintain stability and justice, and the necessary instrument for this was a strong monarch. Thus one of the things the Sassanians aimed for was to be an urban empire, and were quite successful, during the late Sassanian period, Mesopotamia had the largest population density in the medieval period. One of the reasons for this, was due to the intensity of the founding and refounding of cities by the Sassanians, which is also demonstrated in the surviving Middle Persian text Aras Dunrunair, the provincial capitals of Iran. Ardashir I himself built and rebuilt many cities, which he named after himself, such as Vet Ardashir in Azaristan, Ardashir Quora in Pars and Vaman Ardashir in Meshan. During the Sassanian period, many cities with the name Iran Quora were established. This was due to the ideology the Sassanians believed in, which was about the revival of Avestan ideology. Many of the these newly established cities, and the older ones too, were not only populated by familiar ethnic groups, such as the Iranians or Assyrians, but also by Roman prisoners of war, such as the Goths, Slavs, Latins, and many more. Many of these prisoners were experienced workers, who were used to build things such as cities, bridges, dams, and more. This made the Sassanians become familiar with Roman technology. The impact this made foreigners made on the economy was very important, but also resulted in the arrival of many Christians, which greatly increased the spread of Christianity in the empire. Unlike the amount of information about the settled people of the Sassanian Empire, there is little about the nomadic slash unsettled ones. It is known that that they were called for Kurd by the Sassanians, and were used in profitable way by them, they were often used in the military by the Sassanians, the Dale Amit, and Jilani nomads being the most prominent of them. This way of handling the nomads continued into the Islamic period, where the service of the Dale Amits and Jilanis continued to be profitable. The Shahan Shah the head of the Sassanian Empire was the Shahan Shah, King of Kings, also simply known as the Shah, King. His health and welfare was always important and the phrase may you be immortal was used to reply to him with. By looking on the Sassanian coins which appeared from the 6th century and afterwards, a moon and sun is noticeable. The meaning of the moon and sun, in the words of the Iranian historian Turajdari, suggest that the king was at the center of the world and the sun and moon revolved around him. In effect he was the king of the four corners of the world, which was an old Mesopotamian idea. The king saw all other rulers, such as the Romans, Turks, and Chinese below him. The king wore colorful clothes, makeup, a heavy crown, while his beard was decorated with gold. The early Sassanian kings considered themselves of divine descent, they called themselves for bay, divine. When the king went to the publicity, he was hidden behind a curtain, and had some of his men in front of him, whose duty was to keep the masses away from the king and to make his way clear. When one came to the king, he slashed she had to prostrate before him, also known as proskinesis. The king was guarded by a group of royal guards, known as the Pushtig Ban. On other occasions, the king was protected by a group of palace guards, known as the Derigan. Both of these groups were enlisted from royal families of the Sassanian Empire, and were under the command of the Hazarbed, who was in charge of the king's safety, controlled the entrance of the king's palace, presented visitors to the king, and was allowed to be given military command or used in negotiations. The Hazarbed was also allowed in some cases to serve as the royal executioner. During Nauras, Iranian New Year, and Miragan, Mir's Day, the king would hold a speech. Sassanid society was immensely complex, 
with separate systems of social organization governing numerous different groups within the empire. Historians believe society comprised four social classes. Asranan, priests. Arteshtaran, warriors. Waster Yoshin, commoners. Hutukshan, artisans. At the center of the Sasanian caste system the Shahan Shah ruled over all the nobles. The royal princes, petty rulers, great landlords, and priests, together constituted a privileged stratum, and were identified as Wuzergan, or grandees. This social system appears to have been fairly rigid. The Sasanian caste system outlived the empire, continuing in the early Islamic period. Slavery In general, Mass slavery was never practiced by the Iranians, and in many cases the situation and lives of semi-slaves, prisoners of war, were, in fact, better than those of the commoner. The term slave was also used on people who were in debt and had to use some of their time to serve in a fire temple. The most common slaves in the Sasanian Empire was the household servants, who worked in private estates and at the fire temples. Usage of a woman slave in a home was common and her master had outright control over her and could even produce children with her if he wanted to. Slaves also received wages and were able to have their own families whether they were female or male. Harming a slave was considered a crime, and not even the king himself was allowed to do it. The master of a slave was allowed to free the person when he wanted to, which, no matter what faith the slave believed in, was considered a good deed. A slave could also be freed if his slash her master died. Culture Education There was a major school, called the Grand School, in the capital. In the beginning, only 50 students were allowed to study at the Grand School. In less than 100 years, enrollment at the Grand School was over 30,000 students. Membership in a class was based on birth although it was possible for an exceptional individual to move to another class on the basis of merit. The function of the king was to ensure that each class remained within its proper boundaries, so that the strong did not oppress the weak, nor the weak the strong. To maintain this social equilibrium was the essence of royal justice, and its effective functioning depended on the glorification of the monarchy above all other classes. On a lower level, Sasanian society was divided into Azadan, freemen, who jealously guarded their status as descendants of ancient Aryan conquerors, and the mass of originally non-Aryan peasantry. The Azadan formed a large low aristocracy of low-level administrators, mostly living on small estates. The Azadan provided the cavalry backbone of Sasanian army. The Sasanian kings were enlightened patrons of letters and philosophy. Khosrau I had the works of Plato and Aristotle translated into Pallavi taught at Gundasapur and even read them himself. During his reign, many historical annals were compiled, of which the sole survivor is the Karnamakai Artak Shurai Paypakan, Deeds of Artashur, a mixture of history and romance that served as the basis of the Iranian national epic, the Shahnameh. When Justinian I closed the schools of Athens, seven of their professors fled to Persia and found refuge at Khosrau's court. In time they grew homesick, and in his treaty of 533 with Justinian, the Sasanian king stipulated that the Greek sages should be allowed to return and be free from persecution. Under Khosrau I, the Academy of Gundasapur, which had been founded in the 5th century, became the greatest intellectual center of the time, drawing students and teachers from every quarter of the known world. Nestorian Christians were received there, and brought Syriac translations of Greek works in medicine and philosophy. Neoplatonists too, came to Gundasapur, where they planted the seeds of Sufi mysticism, the medical lore of India, Persia, Syria and Greece mingled there to produce a flourishing school of therapy. Artistically, the Sasanian period witnessed some of the highest achievements of Iranian civilization. Much of what later became known as Muslim culture, including architecture and writing, was originally drawn from Persian culture. At its peak, the Sasanian Empire stretched from Syria to northwest India, but its influence was felt far beyond these political boundaries. Sasanian motifs found their way into the art of Central Asia and China, the Byzantine Empire, and even Merovingian France. Islamic art however, was the true heir to Sasanian art, 
whose concepts it was to assimilate while, at the same time instilling fresh life and renewed vigor into it. According to Will Durant, Sasanian art exported its forms and motifs eastward into India, Turkestan, and China, westward into Syria, Asia Minor, Constantinople, the Balkans, Egypt and Spain. Probably its influence helped to change the emphasis in Greek art from classic representation to Byzantine ornament, and in Latin Christian art from wooden ceilings to brick or stone vaults and domes and buttressed walls. Sasanian carvings at Taki Boston and Naksheri Rustam were colored, so were many features of the palaces, but only traces of such painting remain. The literature, however, makes it clear that the art of painting flourished in Sasanian times, the prophet Mani is reported to have founded a school of painting, Ferdowsi speaks of Persian magnates adorning their mansions with pictures of Iranian heroes, and the poet al Burchari describes the murals in the palace at Tesafon. When a Sasanian king died, the best painter of the time was called upon to make a portrait of him for a collection kept in the royal treasury. Painting, sculpture, pottery and other forms of decoration shared their designs with Sasanian textile art. Silks, embroideries, brocades, damasks, tapestries, chair covers, canopies, tents and rugs were woven with patience and masterly skill, and were dyed in warm tints of yellow, blue and green. Every Persian but the peasant and the priest aspired to dress above his class, presents often took the form of sumptuous garments, and great colorful carpets had been an appendage of wealth in the East since Assyrian days. The two dozen Sasanian textiles that have survived are among the most highly valued fabrics in existence. Even in their own day, Sasanian textiles were admired and imitated from Egypt to the Far East, and during the Middle Ages, they were favored for clothing the relics of Christian saints. When Heraclius captured the palace of Khosrau II Pervez at Dastagerd, delicate embroideries and an immense rug were among his most precious spoils. Famous was the winter carpet, also known as Khosrau's spring, spring season carpet, of Khosrau Aina Shirvan designed to make him forget winter in its spring and summer scenes, flowers and fruits made of inwoven rubies and diamonds grew, in this carpet, beside walks of silver and brooks of pearls traced on a ground of gold. Harun al-Rashid prided himself on a spacious Sasanian rug thickly studded with jewelry. Persians wrote love poems about their rugs. Studies on Sasanian remains show over 100 types of crowns being worn by Sasanian kings. The various Sasanian crowns demonstrate the cultural, economic, social, and historical situation in each period. The crowns also show the character traits of each king in this era. Different symbols and signs on the crowns the moon, stars, eagle, and palm, each illustrate the wearer's religious faith and beliefs. The Sasanians' dynasty, like the Achaemenid, originated in the province of Pars. The Sasanians saw themselves as successors of the Achaemenids, after the Hellenistic and Parthian interlude, and believed that it was their destiny to restore the greatness of Persia. In reviving the glories of the Achaemenid past, the Sasanians were no mere imitators. The art of this period reveals an astonishing virility, in certain respects anticipating key features of Islamic art. Sasanian art combined elements of traditional Persian art with Hellenistic elements and influences. The conquest of Persia by Alexander the Great had inaugurated the spread of Hellenistic art into Western Asia. Though the East accepted the outward form of this art, it never really assimilated its spirit. Already in the Parthian period, Hellenistic art was being interpreted freely by the peoples of the Near East. Throughout the Sasanian period, there was reaction against it. Sasanian art revived forms and traditions native to Persia, and in the Islamic period, these reached the shores of the Mediterranean. According to Ferguson, with the accession of the Sasanians, Persia regained much of that power and stability to which she had been so long a stranger. The improvement in the fine arts at home indicates returning prosperity, and a degree of security unknown since the fall of the Achaemenidae. Surviving palaces illustrate the splendor in which the Sasanian monarchs lived. Examples include palaces at Firuzabad and Bishapur in Fars, and the capital city of Tesafon in the Azaristan province, present-day Iraq. In addition to local traditions, Parthian architecture influenced Sasanian architectural characteristics. 
All are characterized by the barrel vaulted Ewans introduced in the Parthian period. During the Sasanian period, these reached massive proportions, particularly at Tesaphon. There, the arch of the great vaulted hall, attributed to the reign of Shapur I, 241-272, has a span of more than 80 feet, 24 m, and reaches a height of 118 feet, 36 m. This magnificent structure fascinated architects in the centuries that followed and has been considered one of the most important examples of Persian architecture. Many of the palaces contain an inner audience hall consisting, as at Firuzabad, of a chamber surmounted by a dome. The Persians solved the problem of constructing a circular dome on a square building by employing squinches, or arches built across each corner of the square, thereby converting it into an octagon on which it is simple to place the dome. The dome chamber in the palace of Firuzabad is the earliest surviving example of the use of the squinch, suggesting that this architectural technique was probably invented in Persia. The unique characteristic of Sasanian architecture was its distinctive use of space. The Sasanian architect conceived his building in terms of masses and surfaces, hence the use of massive walls of brick decorated with molded or carved stucco. Stucco wall decorations appear at Bishapur but better examples are preserved from Chal Tarkhan near Ray, late Sasanian or early Islamic in date, and from Tesaphon and Kish in Mesopotamia. The panels show animal figures set in roundels, human busts, and geometric and floral motifs. At Bishapur, some of the floors were decorated with mosaics showing scenes of banqueting. The Roman influence here is clear, and the mosaics may have been laid by Roman prisoners. Buildings were decorated with wall paintings. Particularly fine examples have been found on Mount Kajay in Sistan. Economy Due to the majority of the inhabitants being of peasantry stock, the Sasanian economy relied on farming and agriculture, Husistan and Iraq being the most important provinces for it. The Naravan Canal is one of the greatest examples of Sasanian irrigation systems, and many of these things can still be found in Iran. The mountains of the Sasanian state was used on lumbering by the nomads of the region, and due to the great centralization of the Sasanians, they also managed to impose tax on the nomads and inhabitants of the mountains. During the reign of Khosrau I, further land was brought under centralization. Two trade routes were used during the Sasanian period, one in the north, the famous Silk Route, and one less prominent route in the southern Sasanian coast. The factories of Susa, Gundasapur, and Shushtar were famously known for their production of silk, and rivaled the Chinese factories. The Sasanians showed great toleration to the inhabitants of the countryside, which was important to create a great deal of stuff in case of famine. Industry and Trade Sasanian Sea Trade Routes Persian industry under the Sasanians developed from domestic to urban forms. Guilds were numerous. Good roads and bridges, well patrolled, enabled state post and merchant caravans to link Tesaphon with all provinces, and harbors were built in the Persian Gulf to quicken trade with India. Sasanian merchants ranged far and wide and gradually ousted Romans from the lucrative Indian Ocean trade routes. Recent archaeological discovery has shown an interesting fact that Sasanians used special labels, commercial labels on goods as a way of promoting their brands and distinguish between different qualities. Khosrau I further extended the already vast trade network. The Sasanian state now tended toward monopolistic control of trade, with luxury goods assuming a far greater role in the trade than heretofore, and the great activity in building of ports, caravanserais, bridges and the like, was linked to trade and urbanization. The Persians dominated international trade, both in the Indian Ocean, Central Asia, and South Russia, in the time of Khosrau, although competition with the Byzantines was at times intense. Sassanian settlements in Oman and Yemen testify to the importance of trade with India, but the silk trade with China was mainly in the hands of Sassanian vassals and the Iranian people, the Sogdians. The main exports of the Sassanians were silk, woolen and golden textiles, carpets and rugs, hides, and leather and pearls from the Persian Gulf. There were also goods in transit from China, paper, silk, and India, spices, which Sasanian customs imposed taxes upon, and which were re-exported from the empire to Europe. 
It was also a time of increased metallurgical production, so Iran earned a reputation as the Armory of Asia. Most of the Sasanian mining centers were at the fringes of the empire in Armenia, the Caucasus, and above all, Transoxania. The extraordinary mineral wealth of the Pamir Mountains on the eastern horizon of the Sasanian Empire led to a legend among the Tajiks, an Iranian people living there, which is still told today. It said that when God was creating the world, he tripped over Pamirs, dropping his jar of minerals, which spread across the region. Under Parthian rule, Zoroastrianism had fragmented into regional variations which also saw the rise of local cult deities, some from Iranian religious tradition but others drawn from Greek tradition too. Greek paganism and religious ideas had spread and mixed with Zoroastrianism when Alexander the Great had conquered the Persian Empire from Darius III, a process of Greco-Persian religious and cultural synthesization which had continued into the Parthian era too. But under the Sassanids, an orthodox Zoroastrianism was revived and the religion would undergo numerous and important developments. Sassanid Zoroastrianism would develop to have clear distinctions from the practices laid out in the Avesta, the holy books of Zoroastrianism. It is often argued that the Sassanid Zoroastrian clergy later modified the religion in a way to serve themselves, causing substantial religious uneasiness specify Sassanid religious policies contributed to the flourishing of numerous religious reform movements, most importantly the Mani and Mazdak religions. The relationship between the Sassanid kings and the religions practiced in their empire became complex and varied. For instance, while Shapur I tolerated and encouraged a variety of religions and seems to have been a Zervanite himself, religious minorities at times were suppressed under later kings, such as Bahram II. Shapur II, on the other hand, tolerated religious groups except Christians, whom he only persecuted in the wake of Constantine's conversion. Tansar and his justification for Ardashir I's rebellion. From the very beginning of Sassanid rule in 224 an orthodox pars-oriented Zoroastrian tradition would play an important part in influencing and lending legitimization to the state until its collapse in the mid-7th century AD. After Ardashir I had deposed the last Parthian king, Artabanus V, he sought the aid of Tansar, a Urbad, high priest of the Iranian Zoroastrians to aid him in acquiring legitimization for the new dynasty. This Tansar did by writing to the nominal and vassal kings in different regions of Iran to accept Ardashir I as their new king, most notably in the letter of Tansar, which was addressed to Gushnasp, the vassal king of Tabarestan. Gushnasp had accused Ardashir I of having forsaken tradition by usurping the throne, and that while his actions may have been good for the world they were bad for the faith. Tansar refuted these charges in his letter to Gushnasp by proclaiming that not all of the old ways had been good, and that Ardashir was more virtuous than his predecessors. The letter of Tansar included some attacks on the religious practices and orientation of the Parthians, who did not follow an orthodox Zoroastrian tradition but rather a heterodox one, and so attempted to justify Ardashir's rebellion against them by arguing that Zoroastrianism had decayed after Alexander's invasion a decay which had continued under the Parthians and so needed to be restored. Tansar would later help to oversee the formation of a single Zoroastrian church under the control of the Persian Magi, alongside the establishment of a single set of Avestan texts, which he himself approved and authorized. The Influence of Kartir Kartir, a very powerful and influential Persian cleric, served under several Sassanid kings and actively campaigned for the establishment of a Pars-centered Zoroastrian orthodoxy across the Sassanid Empire. His power and influence grew so much that he became the only commoner to later be allowed to have his own rock inscriptions carved in the royal fashion, at Sarmashhad, Naksheri Rustam, Kabiye Yazartosht, and Naksheri Rajab. Under Shapur I, Kartir was made the absolute authority over the order of priests at the Sassanid court and throughout the empire's regions too, with the implication that all regional Zoroastrian clergies would now for the first time be subordinated the Persian Zoroastrian clerics of Pars. To some extent Kartir was an iconoclast and took it upon himself to help establish numerous Bahram fires throughout Iran in the place of the Bagan slash Ayazans, monuments and temples containing images and idols of cult deities that had proliferated during the Parthian era. In expressing his doctrinal orthodoxy, 
Cartier also encouraged an obscure Zoroastrian concept known as Kvadota among the common folk, marriage within the family, between siblings, cousins. At various stages during his long career at court, Cartier also oversaw the periodic persecution of the non-Zoroastrians in Iran, and secured the execution of the Prophet Mani during the reign of Baramai. During the reign of Hormizdi, the predecessor and brother of Baramai, Cartier was awarded the new Zoroastrian title of Mabad a clerical title that was to be considered higher than that of the Eastern Iranian, Parthian, title of Urbad. Zoroastrian Calendar Reforms Under the Sassanians The Persians had long known of the Egyptian calendar, with its 365 days divided into 12 months. However, the traditional Zoroastrian calendar had 12 months of 30 days each. During the reign of Ardashur I, an effort was made to introduce a more accurate Zoroastrian calendar for the year, so five extra days were added to it. These five extra days were named the Gatha days and had a practical as well as religious use. However, they were still kept apart from the religious year, so as not to disturb the long-held observances of the older Zoroastrian calendar. Some difficulties arose with the introduction of the first calendar reform particularly the pushing forward of important Zoroastrian festivals such as Hamas Batmadea and Nauras on the calendar year by year. This confusion apparently caused much distress among ordinary people, and while the Sassanids tried to enforce the observance of these great celebrations on the new official dates, much of the populace continued to observe them on the older, traditional dates, and so parallel celebrations for Nauras and other Zoroastrian celebrations would often occur within days of each other in defiance of the new official calendar dates, causing much confusion and friction between the laity and the ruling class. A compromise on this by the Sassanids was later introduced, by linking the parallel celebrations as a six-day celebration slash feast. This was done for all except Nauras. A further problem occurred as Nauras had shifted in position during this period from the spring equinox to autumn although this inconsistency with the original spring equinox date for Nauras had possibly occurred during the Parthian period too. Further calendar reforms occurred during the later Sassanid era. Ever since the reforms under Ardashur I there had been no intercalation. Thus with a quarter day being lost each year, the Zoroastrian holy year had slowly slipped backwards, with Nauras eventually ending up in July. A great council was therefore convened and it was decided that Nauras be moved back to the original position it had during the Achaemenid period, back to spring. This change probably took place during the reign of Kavadai in the early 6th century AD. Much emphasis seems to have been placed during this period on the importance of spring and on its connection with the resurrection and Frashigurd. The Three Great Fires Reflecting the regional rivalry and bias the Sassanids are believed to have held against their Parthian predecessors, it was probably during the Sassanid era that the two great fires in Pars and Media, the Adar Farnbag and Adar Gushnasp respectively, were promoted to rival, and even eclipse, the sacred fire in Parthia, the Adar Burzan Mare. The Adar Burzan Mare, linked, in legend, with Zoroaster and Vishtaspa, the first Zoroastrian king, was too holy for the Persian Magi to put an end to veneration for it, however, it was demoted during the Sassanid era. It was therefore during the Sassanid era that the three great fires of the Zoroastrian world were given specific associations. The Adar Farnbag in Pars became associated with the Magi, Adar Gushnasp in Media with warriors, and Adar Burzanmer in Parthia with the lowest estate, farmers and herdsmen. The Adar Gushnasp eventually became, by custom, a place of pilgrimage by foot for newly enthroned kings after their coronation. It is likely that during the Sassanid era that these three great fires became central places for pilgrimage among Zoroastrians. Iconoclasm and the elevation of Persian over other Iranian languages The early Sassanids ruled against the use of cult images in worship, and so statues and idols were removed from many temples and where possible, sacred fires were installed instead. This policy extended even to the non-Iran regions of the empire during some periods. Hormizdi allegedly destroyed statues erected for the dead in Armenia. However, only cult statues were removed. The Sassanids continued to use images to represent the deities of Zoroastrianism, including that of Ahuram Mazda, 
in the tradition that was established during the Seleucid era. In the early Sassanid period royal inscriptions often consisted of Parthian, Middle Persian and Greek. However, the last time Parthian was used for a royal inscription came during the reign of Narse, son of Shapur I. It is likely therefore that soon after this, the Sassanids made the decision to impose Persian as the sole official language within Iran, and forbade the use of written Parthian. This had important consequences for Zoroastrianism, given that all secondary literature, including the Zand, were then recorded only in Middle Persian, having a profound impact in orienting Zoroastrianism towards the influence of the Pars region, the homeland of the Sassanids. Developments in Zoroastrian Literature and Liturgy by the Sassanids Some scholars of Zoroastrianism such as Mary Boyce have speculated that it is possible that the Yasna service was lengthened during the Sassanid era to increase its impressiveness. This appears to have been done by joining the Gathic Staoda Yasna with the Hauma ceremony. Furthermore, it is believed that another longer service developed, known as the Visparad, which derived from the extended Yasna. This was developed for the celebration of the seven holy days of obligation, the Gahambars plus Nauras, and was dedicated to Ahuram Mazda. While the very earliest Zoroastrians eschewed writing as a form of demonic practice, the Middle Persians and, along with much secondary Zoroastrian literature, was recorded in writing during the Sassanid era for the first time. Many of these Zoroastrian texts were original works from the Sassanid period. Perhaps the most important of these works was the Bunda Ish and the mythical Zoroastrian story of creation. Other older works, some from remote antiquity, were possibly translated from different Iranian languages into Middle Persian during this period. For example, two works, the Draktiya Surik, Assyrian Tree, and Ayyajari Zararan, Exploits of Zartar, were probably translated from Parthian originals. Of great importance for Zoroastrianism was the creation of the Avestan alphabet by the Sassanids, which enabled the accurate rendering of the Avesta in written form, including in its original language slash phonology, for the first time. The alphabet was based on the Pallavi one, but rather than the inadequacy of that script for recording spoken Middle Persian, the Avestan alphabet had 46 letters, and was well suited to recording Avestan in written form in the way the language actually sounded and was uttered. The Persian Magi were therefore finally able to record all surviving ancient Avestan texts in written form. As a result of this development, the Sassanid Avesta was then compiled into 21 nasks, divisions, to correspond with the 21 words of the Ahunavar invocation. The nasks were further divided into three groups of seven. The first group contained the Gathas and all texts associated with them, while the second group contained works of scholastic learning. The final section contained treatises of instruction for the Magi, such as the Vendidad, law texts and other works, such as Yashts. An important literary text, the Quadanamug, Book of Kings, was composed during the Sassanid era. This text is the basis of which the later Shahnameh of Ferdowsi drew from. Another important Zoroastrian text from the Sassanid period includes the dates to Nimanagi Krad, Judgments of the Spirit of Wisdom. Christianity. Christians in the Sassanid Empire belonged mainly to the Nestorian Church, Church of the East, and the Jacobite Church, Syriac Orthodox Church, branches of Christianity. Although these churches originally maintained ties with Christian churches in the Roman Empire, they were indeed quite different from them. One reason for this was that the liturgical language of the Nestorian and Jacobite churches was Syriac rather than Greek the language of Roman Christianity during the early centuries, and the language of Eastern Roman Christianity in later centuries. Another reason for a separation between Eastern and Western Christianity was strong pressure from the Sassanid authorities to sever connections with Rome, since the Sassanid Empire was often at war with the Roman Empire. Christianity was recognized by King Yazdijerd I in 409 as an allowable faith within the Sassanid Empire. The major break with mainstream Christianity came in 431, due to the pronouncements of the First Council of Ephesus. The council condemned Nestorius, a theologian of Cilician slash Cilician origin and the Patriarch of Constantinople, for teaching a view of Christology in accordance with which he refused to call Mary, 
the mother of Jesus Christ, Theotokos, or mother of God. While the teaching of the Council of Ephesus was accepted within the Roman Empire, the Sassanid Church disagreed with the condemnation of Nestorius' teachings. When Nestorius was deposed as Patriarch, a number of his followers fled to the Sassanid Persian Empire. Persian emperors used this opportunity to strengthen Nestorius' position within the Sassanid Church, which made up the vast majority of the Christians in the predominantly Zoroastrian Persian Empire, by eliminating the most important pro-Roman clergymen in Persia and making sure that their places were taken by Nestorians. This was to assure that these Christians would be loyal to the Persian Empire, and not to the Roman. Most of the Christians in the Sassanid Empire lived on the western edge of the empire, predominantly in Mesopotamia, but there were also important communities on the island of Tylos, present-day Bahrain, the southern coast of the Persian Gulf, the area of the Arabian Kingdom of Lakam, and the Persian part of Armenia. Some of these areas were the earliest to be Christianized, the Kingdom of Armenia became the first independent Christian state in the world in 301. While a number of Assyrian territories had almost become fully Christianized even earlier during the 3rd century, they never became independent nations. Other Religions Some of the recent excavations have discovered the Buddhist, Hindu and Jewish religious sites in the empire. Buddhism and Hinduism were competitors of Zoroastrianism in Bactria and Margayana. A very large Jewish community flourished under Sassanid rule with thriving centers at Isfahan, Babylon, and Khorasan, and with its own semi-autonomous exilarchate leadership based in Mesopotamia. Jewish communities suffered only occasional persecution. They enjoyed a relative freedom of religion, and were granted privileges denied to other religious minorities. Shapurai, Shabba Malka in Aramaic, was a particular friend to the Jews. His friendship with Shmuel produced many advantages for the Jewish community. He even offered the Jews in the Sassanid Empire a fine white Nisian horse, just in case the Messiah, who was thought to ride a donkey or a mule, would come. Shapur II, whose mother was Jewish, had a similar friendship with a Babylonian rabbi named Rabbah. Rabbah's friendship with Shapur II enabled him to secure a relaxation of the oppressive laws enacted against the Jews in the Persian Empire. Moreover, in the eastern portion of the empire, Various Buddhist places of worship, notably in Bamiyan were active as Buddhism gradually became more popular in that region. Language Official Languages During the early Sasanian period, Middle Persian, along with Greek and Parthian, and together appeared in the inscriptions of the early Sasanian kings. However, by the time Narse, R293302, was ruling, Greek was no longer in use perhaps due to the disappearance of Greek and Slash or the anti-Hellenic Zoroastrian clergy had finally managed to remove it once and for all. This was probably also because Greek was a commonplace among the Romans Slash Byzantines, the rival of the Sasanians. Parthian soon disappeared as an administrate language too, but was continued to be spoken and written in the eastern part of the Sasanian Empire, the homeland of the Parthians. Furthermore, Many of the Parthian aristocrats who had entered into Sasanian service after the fall of the Parthian Empire, still spoke Parthian, such as the seven Parthian clans, who possessed much power within the empire. Sometimes one of the members of the clans would challenge Sasanian rule. Aramaic, like in the Achaemenid Empire, was widely used in the Sasanian Empire, and provided scripts for Middle Persian and other languages. Regional Languages Although Middle Persian was the native language of the Sasanians, who, however, were not originally from Pars, it was only a minority spoken language in the vast Sasanian Empire, it only formed the majority of Pars, while it was widespread around Media and its surrounding regions. However, there were several different Persian dialects during that time. Besides Persian, Adhari along with one of its dialects, Tati, was spoken in Adurbadagan, Azerbaijan. Dale Amit and Gileki was spoken in Jalan, while Mazandarani, also known as Taberi, was spoken in Tabaristan, Mazandaran. Furthermore, many other languages and dialects were spoken in the two regions. In Huzestan, several languages were spoken, Persian in the north and east, while Aramaic was spoken in the rest of the place. 
In Meshan, the Arameans, along with settled Arabs, known as Mesnian Arabs, and the nomadic Arabs, formed the Semitic population of the province along with Nabataean and Pomerane merchants. Iranians had also begun to settle in the province, along with the Zut, who had been deported from India. Other Indian groups such as the Malays may also have been deported to Meshan, either as captives or recruited sailors. In Azaristan, the majority of the people were Aramaic-speaking Assyrians, while the Persians, Jews, and Arabs formed a minority in the province. Due to invasions from the Scythians and their subgroup, the Alans into Azerbaijan, Armenia, and other places in Caucasus, the places gained a larger, although small, Iranian population. Parthian, along with other Iranian dialects and languages was spoken in Khorasan, while to the further east in places which were not always controlled by the Sasanians, Sogdian, Bactrian, and Khwarazman was spoken. To the further south in Sistan, a place which during the Parthian period saw an influx of Scythians to the place, Sistani was spoken. Kerman was populated by an Iranian group which closely resembled the Persians, while to the further east in Paritan, Turin, Macron, Balashi and non-Iranian languages were spoken. In major cities such as Gundasapur and Tesaphon, Latin, Greek, and Syriac was spoken by roman byzantine prisoners of war. Furthermore, Slavic and Germanic was also spoken in the Sasanian Empire, once again due to the capture of Roman soldiers. Legacy and Importance The influence of the Sasanid Empire continued long after it ceased to exist. The Empire, through the guidance of several able emperors prior to its fall, had achieved a Persian Renaissance that would become a driving force behind the civilization of the newly established religion of Islam. In modern Iran and the regions of the Iranosphere, the Sasanid period is regarded as one of the high points of Iranian civilization. Sasanid culture and military structure had a significant influence on Roman civilization. The structure and character of the Roman army was affected by the methods of Persian warfare. In a modified form, the Roman imperial autocracy imitated the royal ceremonies of the court of the Sasanids at Tesaphon, and those in turn had an influence on the ceremonial traditions of the courts of modern Europe. The origin of the formalities of European diplomacy is attributed to the diplomatic relations between the Persian governments and Roman Empire. In Jewish history In Jewish history, the Sasanid Empire is a very important chapter in the expansion of the Jewish faith. The Sasanid period saw major developments such as the construction of the Babylonian Talmud and the establishment of several Jewish-orientated academic institutions such as Surah and Pumadita which were for centuries the most influential in Jewish scholarship. Several individuals of the imperial family such as Ifra Hormized the Queen Mother of Shapur II and Queen Shushandukt, the Jewish wife of Yazdi Jerdai, significantly contributed to the close relations between the Jews of the Empire and the government in Tesaphon. In India The collapse of the Sasanid Empire caused the state religion to be switched from Zoroastrianism to Islam. Zoroastrianism slowly went from a major religion to a persecuted minor religion. For the survival of their faith and their lives, a large number of Zoroastrians chose to emigrate. According to the Kissa i Sanjan, one group of those refugees landed in what is now Gujarat, India, where they were allowed greater freedom to observe their old customs and to preserve their faith. The descendants of those Zoroastrians would play a small but significant role in the development of India. Today there are over 70,000 Zoroastrians in India. The Zoroastrians, still use a variant of the religious calendar instituted under the Sasanids. That calendar still marks the number of years since the accession of Yazdijerd III, just as it did in 632, which was separated from the rest of Iran. Crowned in 224 at Tesaphon as the sole ruler of Persia, Ardashir took the title Shahanshah, or King of Kings, the inscriptions mention Adharanahid as his Banbishan and Banbishan, Queen of Queens, but her relationship with Ardashir is not established, bringing the 400-year-old Parthian Empire to an end, and beginning four centuries of Sasanid rule. In the next few years, local rebellions would form around the empire. Nonetheless, Ardashir I further expanded his new empire to the east and northwest, conquering the provinces of Sistan, Gorgon, Khorasan, Margayana, 
in modern Turkmenistan, Balk and Karizmia. He also added Bahrain and Mosul to Sassanid's possessions. Later Sassanid inscriptions also claim the submission of the kings of Kishan, Turin, and Mikran to Ardashur, although based on numismatic evidence, it is more likely that these actually submitted to Ardashir's son, the future Shapurai. In the west, assaults against Hatra, Armenia, and Adiabani met with less success. In 230, he raided deep into Roman territory, and a Roman counter-offensive two years later ended inconclusively, although the Roman emperor, Alexander Severus, celebrated a triumph in Rome. Radashir I's son Shapur I continued the expansion of the empire, conquering Bactria and the western portion of the Kishan Empire, while leading several campaigns against Rome. Invading Rome and Mesopotamia, Shapur I captured Kari and Nisibis, but in 243 the Roman general Time Sathias defeated the Persians at Resena and regained the lost territories. The Emperor Gordian Iiis, 238-244, subsequent advance down the Euphrates was defeated at Meshuk, 244, leading to Gordian's murder by his own troops and enabling Shapur to conclude a highly advantageous peace treaty with the new Emperor Philip the Arab by which he secured the immediate payment of 500,000 denarii and further annual payments. Shapur soon resumed the war, defeated the Romans at Barbalissos, 253, and then probably took and plundered Antioch. Roman counterattacks under the Emperor Valerian ended in disaster when the Roman army was defeated and besieged at Edessa and Val the Sassanian Empire, slash SSNN slash or slash Essen slash, also known as Sassanian, Sassanid, Sassanid or Neo-Persian Empire, Kamenine known to its inhabitants as Rinsharn and Ra with Makron and in Middle Persian A was the last Iranian Empire before the rise of Islam, ruled by the Sassanian dynasty from 224 AD to 651 AD. The Sassanian Empire, which succeeded the Parthian Empire, was recognized as one of the leading world powers alongside its arch-rival the Byzantine Empire, for a period of more than 400 years. The Sassanian Empire was founded by Ardashir I, after the fall of the Parthian Empire and the defeat of the last Arsacid king, Artabanus V. At its greatest extent, the Sassanid Empire encompassed all of today's Iran, Iraq, Eastern Arabia, Bahrain, Kuwait, Oman, Qatif, Qatar, UAE, the Levant, Syria, Lebanon, Israel, Jordan, the Caucasus, Armenia, Georgia, Azerbaijan, Dagestan, South Ossetia, Abkhazia, Egypt, large parts of Turkey, much of Central Asia, Afghanistan, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, Yemen, and Pakistan. According to a legend, the Vexiloid of the Sassanid Empire was the Diraf Sher Kaviani. The Sassanian Empire during late antiquity is considered to have been one of Iran's most important and influential historical periods and constituted the last great Iranian empire before the Muslim conquest and the adoption of Islam. In many ways, the Sassanid period witnessed the peak of ancient Iranian civilization. Persia influenced Roman culture considerably during the Sassanid period. The Sassanids' cultural influence extended far beyond the empire's territorial borders, reaching as far as Western Europe, Africa, China, and India. It played a prominent role in the formation of both European and Asian medieval art. Much of what later became known as Islamic culture in architecture, poetry, and other subject matter was transferred from the Sassanids throughout the Muslim world. Conflicting accounts shroud the details of the fall of the Parthian Empire and subsequent rise of the Sassanid Empire in mystery. The Sassanid Empire was established in Estakr by Ardashir I. Papak was originally the ruler of a region called Kir. However, by the year 200, he managed to overthrow Gakir, and appoint himself as the new ruler of the Baz Rangids. His mother, Radhak, was the daughter of the provincial governor of Pars. Papak and his eldest son Shapur managed to expand their power over all of Pars. The subsequent events are unclear, due to the elusive nature of the sources. It is certain, however, that following the death of Papak, Ardashir who at the time was the governor of Darabjurd, got involved in a power struggle of his own with his elder brother Shapur. Sources reveal that Shapur, leaving for a meeting with his brother, 
was killed when the roof of a building collapsed on him. By the year 208, over the protests of his other brothers who were put to death, Ardashir declared himself ruler of Pars. Once Ardashir was appointed Shahanshah, he moved his capital further to the south of Pars and founded Ardashir Quora, formerly Gur, modern-day Firuzabad. The city, well supported by high mountains and easily defendable through narrow passes, became the center of Ardashir's efforts to gain more power. The city was surrounded by a high, circular wall, probably copied from that of Darabjurd, and on the north side included a large palace, remains of which still survive today. After establishing his rule over Pars, Ardashir I rapidly extended his territory, demanding fealty from the local princes of Fars, and gaining control over the neighboring provinces of Kerman, Isfahan, Sujana, and Messine. This expansion quickly came to the attention of Artabanus V, the Parthian king, who initially ordered the governor of Husistan to wage war against Ardashir in 224, but the battles were victories for Ardashir. In a second attempt to destroy Ardashir, Artabanus V himself met Ardashir in battle at Hormozgan, where Artabanus V met his death. Following the death of the Parthian ruler, Ardashir I went on to invade the western provinces of the now defunct Parthian Empire. At that time the Arsacid dynasty was divided between supporters of Artabanus V and Vologasus VI, which probably allowed Ardashir to consolidate his authority in the south with little or no interference from the Parthians. Ardashir was aided by the geography of the province of Farsj, the rugged Armenian terrain was favorable to Roman infantry, but not to Sassanid cavalry. Local aid gave Galerius the advantage of surprise over the Persian forces, and, in two successive battles, Galerius secured victories over Narsae. During the second encounter, Roman forces seized Narsae's camp, his treasury, his harem, and his wife along with it. Galerius advanced into Media and Adiabene, winning successive victories, most prominently near Erzurum, and securing Nisibis, Nasibin, Turkey, before October 1, 298. He moved down the Tigris, taking Tesiphon. Narse had previously sent an ambassador to Galerius to plead for the return of his wives and children. Peace negotiations began in the spring of 299 with both Diocletian and Galerius presiding. The conditions of the peace were heavy, Persia would give up territory to Rome, making the Tigris the boundary between the two empires. Further terms specified that Armenia was returned to Roman domination, with the fort of Zyathi as its border, Caucasian Iberia would pay allegiance to Rome under a Roman appointee, Nisibis, now under Roman rule, would become the sole conduit for trade between Persia and Rome, and Rome would exercise control over the five satrapies between the Tigris and Armenia, Ingilini, Safanin, Safin, Arzanin, Akdiznik, Kortuan, and Zabdasin, near modern Hakkari, Turkey. The Sassanids ceded five provinces west of the Tigris, and agreed not to interfere in the affairs of Armenia and Georgia. In the aftermath of this defeat, Narse gave up the throne and died a year later, leaving the Sassanid throne to his son. Hormized II. Unrest spread throughout the land, and while Hormized II suppressed revolts in Sistan and Kishan, he was unable to control the nobles and was subsequently killed by Bedouins in a hunting trip in 309. First Golden Era, 309-379. Following Hormized II's death, Arabs from the north started to ravage and plunder the eastern cities of the empire, even attacking the province of Fars, the birthplace of the Sassanid kings. Meanwhile, Persian nobles killed Hormized II's eldest son, blinded the second, and imprisoned the third. Arian was captured by Shapur, remaining his prisoner for the rest of his life. Shapur celebrated his victory by carving the impressive rock reliefs in Naksheri Rustam and Bishapur, as well as a monumental inscription in Persian and Greek in the vicinity of Persepolis. He exploited his success by advancing into Anatolia, 260 but withdrew in disarray after defeats at the hands of the Romans and their Pomerane ally Odonathus, suffering the capture of his harem and the loss of all the Roman territories he had occupied. Shapur had intensive development plans. He ordered the construction of the first dam bridge in Iran and founded many cities, some settled in part by emigrants from the Roman territories, 
including Christians who could exercise their faith freely under Sassanid rule. Two cities, Bishapur and Nishapur, are named after him. He particularly favored Mani Chetism, protected Mani, who dedicated one of his books, the Shivaragan, to him, and sent many Manichaean missionaries abroad. He also befriended a Babylonian rabbi called Samuel. This friendship was advantageous for the Jewish community and gave them a respite from the oppressive laws enacted against them. Later kings reversed Shapur's policy of religious tolerance. Under pressure from Zoroastrian Magi and influenced by the high priest Kartir, Baram I killed Mani and persecuted his followers. Baram too was, like his father, amenable to the wishes of the Zoroastrian priesthood. During his reign, the Sassanid capital Tesiphon was sacked by the Romans under Emperor Karas, and most of Armenia, after half a century of Persian rule, was ceded to Diocletian. Succeeding Baram III, who ruled briefly in 293, Narsa embarked on another war with the Romans. After an early success against the Emperor Galerius near Colonicum on the Euphrates in 296, Narsa was decisively defeated. Galerius had been reinforced, probably in the spring of 298, by a new contingent collected from the empire's Danubian holdings. Narsa did not advance from Armenia and Mesopotamia, leaving Galerius to lead the offensive in 298 with an attack on northern Mesopotamia via Armenia. Narsa retreated to Armenia to fight Galerius' force, to Narsa's disadvantage.